And we are back for the grand finale of the G. Steph Cushing Library Secrets of the Cushing Library, Ice and Fire, George R. R. Martin Findings. And uh, Preston, it's been a minute. You're back from vacay. How was that? Oh, I mean, vacation um, when you have children is not really vacation. It's sort of mm. like weekends are no longer <laughs> weekends. Everything's flipped when it comes to um, when it comes to uh, life. Like you're like, oh, when the weekends and long weekends come, you're like, oh no, oh god, I'm not gonna do with the kids. <laughs> but yeah, that's the way vacation is now. It's just like, oh god, how are we gonna entertain these kids um, the <laughs> entire time? At least for the next it's couple of years. <clears throat> Like well, it, I mean, until know. they can go off on their own, like what eight, nine, until you know? until they can go until they can go off to college. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Until they can oh, like you know adequately oh. use like a like a portable Nintendo Switch or Game Boy or whatever the fuck the kids nowadays play and you know entertain themselves yeah, on that. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, you, you give them tablet time, but it's still it's it's overwhelming, overwhelming. <laughs> like yeah, I don't want to get into it, but like you know, kids they they ask the same questions over and over and over and over again just just to like I don't know why just to uh, just to have a connection with you, I think. But it's like you get sick of answering the same questions over and over again, um, and it's nonstop, you know. And they're just hyper, and they're cli- they climb on everything, and it's just, uh, they're you know, they're great, they're great, <laughs> they're great. Well, they're wonderful. So, it's, um, <laughs> the G stuff. What, what, what do we got here? We got the G stuff stuff. So, so while you're on vacation, um, the uh, G stuff they released. For those of you who don't know, G stuff is a Reddit user who went to the Cushing Library and uh, d- dug through some of George R. R. Martin's. Uh, 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 unpublished works and uh, some of his drafts and stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the 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 best the best sort of like fan findings and stuff to to you know talk about theories and change like in years. I mean, it's it's just uh, it's it's good stuff. And but here we are, the grand finale. While you're away on vacation, they released the final one, and I know for a fact that you wanted to get into this and mm. tell me all about it. So, what's going on with the latest one? So well, let's go. Let's go through it. So G stuff. This this is focusing more on G stuff. Covers a lot of John, uh, some Cersei, and some Tyrion, mm-hmm. and, and different observations um, from earlier drafts of of the uh, A Feast for Crows. Um, it, where, back when A Feast for Crows and Dance with Dragons were combined, and um, so we have like John chapters that were written in two thousand three, two thousand four. And we can compare them to what is published in 2011, and we can kind of see like what George changed. Um, and you know, one of the big things that George does is he kind of writes bluntly at first, and then realizes that he's he's gone overboard and needs to make things more subtle. And, and so, one of the things that uh, that that's kind of nice about looking at these early drafts is is he's not as subtle, and so you can kind of get a spoiler, a more of a spoiler. That before something's just hidden, hidden with, you know, so, or just alluded to, and it'll be pretty like outright said in an early draft for, of what, of what George does. Um, so, so for instance, he starts out, uh, G Steps talks about how, uh, John's wolf dreams. So, you, so we know that, um, a feast for, uh, a dance with dragons, a feast for crows starts with John as ghost. And he kind of has different uh, different feelings about the other dire wolves and stuff like that. And there's a line that a lot of people talk about, which is pretty much our only update on what Rickon and Sh- and Shaggy Dog are doing. Um, in in the in the published A Dance with Dragons, there's this one line where it's essentially um, Shaggy Dog taking down a an enormous goat, which everybody kind of knows that it's a it's a unicorn. Because it's on Skagos, and Skagos is famous for unicorns. So the, the published line is like, A wild rain lashed upon the black brother as he tore at the flesh of an enormous goat, washing the blood from his side where the goat's long horn had raked him. And so from this, you know, fans rightly, you know, have deduced that, okay, Rickon really did go to Skagos, and Shaggy Dog seems to have taken down a unicorn. Um, in the, in back in, in 2004, George was a little more blunt with it. Um, he says his black brother was closest prowling over wet rocks through dark holes in the ground. He had taken down a monstrous goat, 
a shaggy white goat as big as any elk with a long horn jutting from its brow, and he was gorging on its flesh, sharing the kill with his other half. And so in that, now, it, you know, it's longer, and, and people say, oh, okay, well, what's really the difference? Well, the difference is the second one actually mentions um, Rickon. I mean, he talks about his other half. He's there. Um, there's a longer description of the unicorn, things like that. Um, <clears throat> what's also interesting is it says, his black brother was closest. This gets into... Uh, so later g stuff will get into, into more of this. But um, John's feelings about the wall and blockage through the wall and things like that. So like if you look at a map, Castle Black to where Bran is should be closest versus like Skagos. Um, but I think the wall might be blocking. So... Skagos would be closest, I guess. Um, you know, or, or, or something. Um, but, it, you know, none, nonetheless, all of this was changed. Uh, G stuff theorizes that it was changed because John shouldn't know that Rickon is alive at this point, And therefore he didn't want to mention the other half. Cause that would like spoil to John that, that Bran and Rickon are alive. Um, but, uh, just, you know, it's like a little, little, little small change there. Um, what what, what kind of interests me here but, is that he shares the kill with his other half. So, like, is the implication here that Rickon is starting to become somewhat wolf-like or, 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 or feral? Exactly. Or or at least, you know, highlighting the fact that, like, he, Rickon 2 is, is um, both is, – is linked to the wolf, uh, you know, very telepathically, you know bound and connected like we kind of knew that from from a game of thrones and a clash of kings but but um more so you know that that rickon is going through the same the same feelings like you wouldn't really think about it like even though aria has connections with numeria we don't think of numeria necessarily being aria's other half because they live very separate lives um but uh or we don't think about sansa's other half being dead you know, like it's just it because she was never really that connected to Lady, um, just a little bit. You know, so here, like, uh, the idea is that Rickon is is bound to Shaggy Dog as at least as much as John is to Ghost or uh, Bran is to Summer. What I find weird about this mm-hmm. is that so why does he have to share his kill with Rickon? Is that, is that implying that maybe Asha or oh, I'm sorry, Osha is no longer with them? Or what? What about the the clans on Skagos? Have they not? Right. I mean, that? it kind of implies that it it does it does um, close like what's going on. Like he, you know, he, that means they're out in the wild surviving, kind of in the same way that Bran is surviving. Right. This whole like sharing your kill thing is something that like Bran and and Summer were, was doing on their on their trip up. And, and, and like, and across the wall, right? That he's out in the wilderness and thus the kill need, needed to be shared. Um, or, you know, an eventual mirror to, to Danny sharing the kill with, um, with Drogon. It, it could also in, be possible uh, that Rickon is just um, going out hunting and he wants to be closer to, uh, the woods with Shaggy Dog. And, you know, maybe they did, maybe Osha is still yeah. with them. <clears throat> Excuse me. Maybe Osha is still with them. Maybe they have made contact with the clans on Skagos. This is just him m- just out having a good time. So that's also possible. Yeah. You know, George just, or most likely George doesn't fucking know and he didn't want to pay, paint himself into a corner. Um, because this, this makes it sound like, okay, they're in the wilderness together eating together well you know maybe he wants it to be that bran was i mean that rickon was captured by some clans and and shaggy dog is off like separated from from him so who knows you know that actually um, i think that's the better explanation that. because you were also the one that said uh one of the reasons why the world of ice and fire doesn't touch on a shy or karth is because george probably wants to visit them in the future so he doesn't want to be confined to what's in those books Based off what he yeah. wants to yeah. to cook up, yeah, this is definitely George's George's style. This is why you know when I talk about like Quentin is alive, like people 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 get so angry about like no Quentin's definitely dead, and it's like nah, dude, like George doesn't know. He like purposely left it open because he doesn't want to paint himself into a corner. He he gives himself outs 
all the time on everything. Like at almost every character, like even even a character that I do firmly believe is you know is probably dead, like uh, like um, uh, Gray Allardine. Wind, Allardine, yeah. He, he there's still <laughs> always an out, right? There's always an out for him. Like oh, they never found the body; it escaped. You know, they, he does this constantly, constantly. There's so many characters. You know, uh, where it's just hearsay that something happens and then that, that allows him to do whatever he wants, you know. So, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a situation. So next, um, there was some, uh, so also some cut stuff about John and Ghost, um, sensing each other. And so <clears throat> I've tried to make sense of the wall and what it means, uh, when it comes to, um, telepathic connections and you know george is george is a little bit of a contradiction um when, when it comes to like what the wall does so like he talks about how um he can't sense ghost if ghost is on the other side of the wall and but at the same time there's definitely like moments where john gets visions clearly caused by ghost when they are separated by the wall. Most notably when ghost returns um, and John is like fighting in the yard and he gets, he, you know, he rages against iron Emmett or he's like in the bathhouse and he has a vision of, of Catalin and Rob it's telling him that, that Winterfell isn't his and things like this. He's, he definitely gets these dreams, but the wall should be blocking. Um, and there's some explanations, like I think when he's fighting Iron Emmett, the tunnel to the wall might be open or something. They, you know, they, they, he tries to give these hints, but it's not necessarily, you know, consistent. Um, or when, when, um, uh, Jojen crosses the wall, he changes personalities completely. And it's like, well, whoever's sending him visions can no longer send him visions. But, but if that's the case, how did Bran get his dreams and all sorts of set stuff? what's what's really going on and i think it's it's he does kind of explain it here in this cut paragraph so george says um on the other side of the wall with the wind was still colder the wolf sensed that was where his brother had gone the gray brother who smelled of summer with the cliff between them the wall he could not sense his brother but sometimes when he padded down the long cold burrow under the ice and poked his nose through the hard black bars he could feel him the snow was falling where his brother was covered all covering all the woods in white and there were hunters near living men and living men and dead men and the ones who wore the shapes of men but smelled only of cold um so this idea that in this passage it sounds like ghost is in the tunnels at castle black under the ground and while he's underground he can he can kind of like bypass the wall you know he's going up to these like holes with bars and he can bypass the wall and sense summer beneath it so i think this idea that you you can send messages underneath the wall might explain like visions and things like that cuz the werewood net and the werewood roots might go underneath the earth and therefore, if we're talking about like how Bran is getting his visions um, from from anything north of the wall, it would be underneath the wall, even though the wall is a, is this blocking telepathic barrier. Um, you know, it's 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 still not exactly consistent with George on like when the wall blocks and when it doesn't. But I think it might give a little more explanation that he that George definitely believes you can go underneath it. At least. That's a very good point about the roots going under the wall, being able to send the signals, because we know that you can't really go over it, and we see that in uh, Fire and Blood when Good Queen Alysanne tries to fly her dragon over it. Yeah. There's definitely a bunch of weird stuff, and and there's, you know, there's whether or not, you know, messages can be reflected off the moon and things like this, which I, you know, I talk about, like, the satellite, the satellite nature of, of the moon, <laughs> the moon being a satellite. I know, but it, but it, the, like they, they literally are constantly talking to the moon. And so it seems like there's, they're like bouncing messages off the moon, like a satellite or something. There's like ways around this barrier, but, but the wall seems to be a telepathic barrier, but a, it's a telepathic barrier here. You can go under and it's a telepathic barrier. That maybe you can go over at certain times. To be but, fair, um, characters talking to the characters talking to the flames. 
Yeah, I know. I know. I know. <laughs> um, so, yeah, he, he was a little more explicit about how, like, yes, definitely underneath underneath the earth um, you can you can get you can bypass the wall. But yeah, the dragons have have trouble flying over the wall. There's there's and then there's the the issue with Arel's eagle. Like, why did the Arel's eagle explode? Um, and you know, may, maybe it tried to cross the barrier of the wall or something. You know, so um, you know, some people just say, "Oh, Melisandre did it," and it's like, well, if Melisandre has the ability to explode birds, she doesn't think about it ever. You know, <laughs> like she, she takes credits for it, but you know, she doesn't ever do it again or talk about that magic. Um, G. Steph notes that there's the hunters aspect to that passage. That there there were hunters hunters near living men and dead men and ones whose shape smelled of men but only of cold. He's clearly talking about the others being hunters, which means that the others would be hunting Bran. Which I suppose we get some element of that when he finally arrives at the cave the the cave of the three eyed crow that the dead the dead men come out of the earth. But there's no real firm explanation on like why the others would know about Bran, would care about Bran, would want to kill Bran. Like certainly in the show we get we get an explanation, but um in the book we don't really have that kind of um explanation. Like why why would the others even know about Bran and why would they be hunting him? But here they seem to be hunting him, so there's also some more aspects to like ghost wanting to range beyond the wall quite a bit. Like that's mentioned in a dance with dragons, but it's a little more explicit in this. And so some people think that like, okay, if, um, if ghost wants to range beyond the wall and he's being very explicit about this, like maybe after John dies and John in John 13, that ghost will range above uh, North of the wall again, and maybe go save, save Bran in the same way that like Bran summer saved John, John would then save Bran at some point. Um, you know, there's some speculation about that, um, that like Ghost would come out and so- somehow save Bran at wherever, wherever he is, um, which I was thinking about that with with time traveling Bran and like time traveling Bran's escape. Um, so I have this theory that like if you've watched my time traveling Bran series, that like that time traveling that Bran is in a time loop trying to trying to get out of the, the cave of the Thread Crow. And that if um, that the various elements of his life, like Hodor and Mira Reed and Jojen, are all elements that he needs to escape the pit. Mira being a great climber, Hodor holding the door, things like this. Um, and that one other aspect could be like he needs John. He needs he needs Ghost you know, as well. And that everything he's doing to manipulate John's life is just to bring ghosts North to help him out of that pit. And that, uh, that, that, that's what he's actually doing. Um, that he just, he needs ghosts to like help him get out of that sinkhole or something. What else is in here? Okay. So there's more talk of the, of the night's watch calling John a warg as well, apparently in the, in the older, in the other, um, in the other, uh, the previous drafts. And I think that it's not surprising because if you, if you read <clears throat> a clash of Kings and a storm of swords, John makes a lot of references to being a warg and everyone talks about him being a warg. And then, and it, it's this like point of tension that like, Oh, he's different. He, you know, he, he might be a warg. Ooh, that's very taboo. But then when a, a dance with dragons happens, that's not really the reason people at the wall are angry at him. They're angry at him over food shortages. They're angry at him for, for letting the wildlings through the wall. But they don't really care about him being a warg. But there, there, there's more of it in his original draft that like the real reason that, that uh, you know, one of the big reasons that they're going to kill him is because they fear him being a warg. Um, but a lot of that was just cut. But moving on, we then have... Melisandra. So next to, um G Steph notes that Melisandre has more visions in in the early drafts of um or at least there's different rumors and there um a, and and more visions from Melisandre that are a little more explicit. So uh do you remember very briefly uh, that well, I mean, it's a small plot point, but it becomes a big plot point because John 
does the baby swap because of it. But at the very early in A Dance with Dragons, John is scared that Stannis is going to burn Mance's son. Do you remember this? Yeah, for the king's blood. Right. And it's not really it's not really certain like um like why? Like I there's a rumor that maybe they'll wake they'll awaken dragons from stone. Um and then John kind of, you know, but John, there aren't any stone dragons, so like what are they talking about? And so just on this like Maester Aemon like mentions that oh I heard this guy talking about how they're they're gonna need some king's blood so maybe you should get rid of these babies so he does the baby swap and then sends off um like ba- like Aemon Battleborn off south with Sam so in in the original draft it's not Aemon that brings the rumor to him but it's Gilly Gilly hears the uh, the rumor and. And there's they're they're just a little more explicit that this is they're looking for King's blood to wake some dragons up. And they um John is more specific about like thinking about the eggs. Like, could there be eggs here at the wall? Like, did did Queen Alisane leave these eggs, or did Stannis bring the eggs from Dragonstone? Which makes you think, like, okay, maybe that's why they couldn't find any eggs on Dragonstone at the, in the epilogue. Did Stannis actually take the eggs, mm. you know, like from Dragonstone? Does he have the eggs? But there's no mention of these eggs or, or, or anything or, or how they would like you know, hatch these eggs or whatever. But it, it seems that George, um, George was at least thinking about, um, about Stannis being very explicit with like why he wants to burn, why he wants King's blood. Um, but of course, in the end, like Stannis doesn't burn any kings. Like he burns Rattleshirt, so maybe Stannis wasn't doing that. And you know this this baby swap, this baby swap is very funny because it's something that happens early in in A Dance with Dragons: A Feast for Crows, and it affects like Sam. But it's never really thought of again by anybody. Like no one really, <laughs> you know, like no one is really worried about the king's blood of these babies no one's really threatening about like burning these babies but we do know that like this eventually kind of leads to like the shireen burning thing that was definitely like george's plan that that we keep thinking though he's going to burn these babies but it's actually like he ends up you know they end up burning shireen um but uh but so they need they need um, to burn someone with king's blood to what is it resurrect dragons that's that's the whole shtick right to wake wake dra- wake dragons from stone but I mean, why, it's clearly a parallel to to danny and the pyre right, right? but why go all the you way know, to the burning. wall to do this they, they could have done this from the beginning when they had edric back on dragonstone before he escapes and instead of leeching him just burn him there on the spot it would have been easier it might be because there's more power at the wall well, Dragonstone is, you know, is, is a place where dragons thrive the most. So it's like the perfect place to do it if you're going to resurrect them. It's, it's, I mean, you're absolutely right. It's, it's, uh, it's all very silly. It's all very <laughs> silly. It's, it's George, it's George throwing around a lot of prophecy and like to make people kind of scared into do into doing things and, and stuff that fans that believe in prophecy and believe all these prophecies mean something like, like cream over. But like, yeah, no, it, it makes no sense. Like if, if Stannis had, eggs at the at dragonstone he would have he would have burned edric storm a long time ago right <laughs> like to, to awaken those eggs right to be fair but like there was no talk of eggs melisandre's there. powers are like so random and somewhat arbitrary because at one point she needs king's blood to supposedly kill uh three other kings which kind of comes to fruition but at the same time, if she also needs King's blood right. to do that, like, why not just drain his ass like a gallon and just do all these things at the same time? It's, it never really made much sense to me. It's, yeah. It's one of the reasons I actually quite like the Melisandre chapter from A Dance with Dragons, because we, we eventually just realize that Melisandre's full of shit. Like, nothing, all of this is just bullshit. Like, her, Melisandre seemingly has just random powers that fit the plot whenever they need to. She has random prophecies that she believes that fit the, that fit the pro- the plot when they need to. Right. Uh, you know, uh, leeches, exploding birds, shadow babies, like, uh, you know, wakening dragons from stone. Like it's just, it's all so utterly random. Um, 
like what prophecies she believes about Azura High and what needs to be done. And she can survive poison on this day. And then we finally get this Melisandre chapter and you realize that, no, she's full of shit. She doesn't have any, she doesn't have any powers. Like, you know, she can look into some flames and maybe eke out like, uh, like a, a vision of something, but that's about it. But Preston, what about the shadow assassin? You got to explain that. You know, the shadow assassins is, is, is the, the one thing that perhaps she can do. <laughs> Everything else is just bull. Okay. It's just bull. And I, and, so all of these like prophecies that she's going around spookily saying, they they I do think that they the 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 story is better for just removing them. It, it just people are paranoid about her, that you know like they're making stuff up like around her. You know she kind of mentions things about power in King's Blood, and everybody's like, oh, she said once that there's powers in uh, in King's Blood. I guess we better like get rid of the babies because she's gonna burn them. It's like, well, she didn't say that. Like you know like. That's that's freaking crazy, you know. So, um, I I guess I I I like the the situation where people attribute stuff to Melisandre when she doesn't actually do stuff, and that she's just full of shit. And because the fandom does it too, like all these people at the wall think Melisandre is spookier and more powerful um, than she is, and she 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 can't do anything. But yeah, but it's her like. There's just a lot more of this apparently about how they want to they want to kill Mance first, and then he, then once he dies, his his baby will be king, and so then they can burn the baby, and then they'll have two kings to wake the dragon, and um, you know that kind of thing. Uh, which you know this whole burning of kings to wake dragons from stone, obviously, just you know it sounds like Danny, you know, but but then it makes us think like okay if. If these prophecies are are so widespread, you know, did Rhaegar believe these things? You know, did did Dunk and Egg did Egg believe these things to, at, at Summerhall? Like, uh, like, you know, it seems that Arian Brightflame kind of believed something like that, or something weird, or you know, the Mad King Aerys might have believed something about rising dragon rising from the ashes and stuff like that. So, um, it's um, yeah. So they have these quotes like like you know. Like, um, you know, Stannis saying, uh, you know, I don't trust the word of an uh, Oathbreaker. Raider sealed his fate. The law says death. And then, and there is power in King's blood, Adam Melisandre, softly. Power we may need before the war is done. Though she did not speak of dragons, John sensed them moving in the smoke behind her words. A cold finger walked up his spine and he resolved to say nothing of the child. You know, like. Melisandre didn't say anything, <laughs> you know. She's just like this power in King's blood, and then John assumes that she's talking about like killing, killing children to wake dragons from stone. So it's um, you know, I I like how John, De- I like how George deleted these things. I like Melisandre being more of a fraud. Uh, I like how how you know. So you know, every time I look at the the changes that are made, they are superior changes, you know, that George, George deleted stuff. And it's like, good that he deleted certain stuff, you know, like, and in in regards to like Melisandre and Stannis, like, so they want to burn Mance and then have a spare for, for uh, Aemon Steel's song later if they need it. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. I mean, or if later people are like, oh, if Stannis dies and gets burned by Ramsay or killed by Ramsay and then Shireen gets burned, that's two kings to wake the dragon, the dragon being John, you know, that kind of <laughs> bullshit. And he's not stone. He's not stone, but he's like, he's like cold, like, ah, like stone, clever. you know, like they, they'll find, they'll find something. It's He's hard and cold, like stone, you know, you can take prophecy and twist it anywhere you want but you know i'm sure somebody somebody's doing that yeah um so oh there's 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 an interesting thing that um where melisandre has a vision about about john going north with 20 rangers um and her going along with him which is which is an interesting little um thing about so apparently in the in in the previous versions of A Dance with Dragons A Feast for Crows, John feels it necessary to bring justice to the to the mutineers at Craster's Keep. And that's deleted from that's deleted from the published book. Which is interesting because that's a plot in the show. Yes. Right? 
that 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 like in the show john felt it necessary to bring justice to the people at craster's keep which i just thought was a dumb plot i thought it was just like why would you waste men the very few men you have to go off to craster's keep and they claimed it was for like intel at the time they're like in but here this is after the the battle of castle black so it wouldn't even be for intel but for some reason john wants to lead an expedition to bring justice to the men at craster's keep and melisandre would be brought along for some reason uh and in the end, it was deleted, which is probably for the best, because there's no reason why John would bother with Craster's Keep. Like, y- you don't have enough men. Like, why would you be going and killing these guys that are that are at Craster's Keep? Like, it makes no makes no difference. Um, Interesting. It, ma- it makes me and, wonder if Dave and Dan had access to some of this stuff because, I mean, made it into the show. Right. That's the weird thing is that that this like boneheaded idea of. Of John leading an expedition to to bring justice to the men at Crestor's Keep was like, George's original the idea. Show. Yeah, yeah. It did it mean like because because these this this was like back in two thousand four, um, like way way back. But I mean, way before the show, like was 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 even in in development. You know, so I mean, I, of course, we don't know when George cut it. Maybe he cut it quite late. Um, the idea of going to Craster's Keep, but nonetheless, it's like the fact that that idea got passed on to that got passed on to to D and D is just really weird. And uh, um, and you made a very good point earlier about the Walkers hunting Bran and coming after him specifically, and now John's John's mission to kill off the mutineers. Yeah, hmm. Dave and Dan definitely had access to these way before anything else. You th- you think that like you think that like he he gave them like. They they said okay we're gonna do the show can we also have early drafts of of a of a dance with dragons a feast for crows and George might have like handed those over to yeah see to I, I don't I don't think they asked I think George offered up anything and everything he had to help with the process of making the show especially when he mm-hmm. was uh, when he was writing Dance with Dragons at the time they were preparing to make it so that would make sense it, it also makes me wonder if George didn't plan to give Cold Hands as much time on page as he did if the original idea was John going sure. to kill the mutineers. And let's be clear, like, the show should have still included Cold Hands, and eventually they kind of did, because even though George has said that Uncle Benjen isn't Cold Hands, I still think Benjen is Cold Hands. And it should have been him who went out there to wipe out Club for Carl and the other mutineers. Like, they could have easily have fit that in in the story if they wanted to. Yeah, it's, it's certainly possible. It's just such a weird thing that, like, that was actually a plot. Like, the, the, the justice to the mutineers, and then it was just, and then it was, it was removed. And then something that we see in the show. You, you know, this does give me some hope reading all these drafts that didn't make it, especially the John Mutineers <clears> thing, because you're, you're right. It's kind of dumb, but it gives me hope that George, who clearly gave Dave and Dan his blueprint on how he wanted to finish the series, he can go back and change things up a bit. Because now, like, yeah. I have some hope now. I have some hope that Arya won't be the one that kills the Night King. Yeah, it, clear, it clearly clearly changes his mind. I mean, it, it very it very well be may be that like Benjen was Cold Hands in some earlier draft, and then he and then he shifts things around. I mean, we, we see a lot of these things. There's a lot of these characters that get shifted into different characters, responsibilities that get shifted into different responsibilities, characters surviving longer or dying earlier. Um, that so George changes his mind a lot. So that, that, that's an interesting aspect of him when people are like, oh, this is going to happen. Well, George hasn't, George, ha- like, it hasn't, something hasn't been written yet. George hasn't made up his mind. Um, the idea that, like, George has everything planned out is ridiculous. Like, he does not. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and he said that he doesn't, he doesn't have everything planned out. He said that, 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 like, he gets bored if he knows what's happening. So, um, but yeah, the, uh, um, by the way, like, I do wonder about Craster's Keep, because you're right that, like, Cold Hands kills some of the mutineers from Craster's Keep. Do you think that, like, the Craster's Keep plot is just done now? Do you think that, like, the, the, even though, like, if you count the bodies, it's not enough bodies, but is the implication just, no, nah, like, Cold Hands killed them all and they're done? And that we're, that's the end of the Craster's Keep plot. I think like, that's the end of the Craster's Keep plot. It, it, it's I know this is going to sound boring, and we we discussed this before in regards yeah. to the pink letter thing. I do think Ramsey wrote it because I don't think George has enough time to introduce an intricate plot and mysteries with the pink letter. <laughs> like I, I know that sounds very boring to everybody, but I I think right, it's done right, right. because he wants to just move on. 
it's funny because with other stuff, you know, like when I first read the series and, you know, you get introduced to the Brave Companions in A Clash of Kings and then, you know, or Rorg and Biter. And you're just like, these, these, these are throwaway characters that you could have just never had appear again. And then they had to be like, instead they had like this detailed story in a storm of swords with with like jamie and brienne and you're like okay fine we could we could we, we don't have to worry about these characters ever again nope nope they're back again brienne has to like kill them off like one by one we have to deal with every single brave companion by name you know like every single one of mountain's men's needs to be killed off like by like individually we need we need every single story on ever on how each of them dies uh, which which I think is ridiculous, but um, you know it, the mutineers. It's like they, maybe they're dead, and if he wants, he you know if he wants those last few to still be alive, he could still have them alive. I don't know, but yeah, I I, I did want to ask about that. Like, like, is that is that just the end of the mutineers? Like, no, well, you know, he killed he killed a few of them, and we just assumed that that was all of them. I don't know, so. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's it's one of those things where it's like maybe maybe he he would he would bring them back. I mean, they can be John's food source, the ghost's food source, as he goes up to find to find a uh, Bran or something. I don't know something. So also in the in the G stuff stuff, uh, uh, G stuff found that um, Mel brought up the Night Fort a lot more. She just she just brings it up a lot more saying like, Oh, we need to move to the night fort. The night fort is the heart of the wall, you know, and all of that kind of stuff was cut, which, um, which, I mean, which is, which is a interesting thing. Cause like there's plenty of time for Melisandre to talk about the night fort and it's just never, it's never really brought up again. Like they're restoring the night fort, but, and may, you know, maybe for an eventual seat, but all the stuff about how like the night fort is super powerful and it's the heart of the wall. And then we need to go to the night fort is, was, was kind of cut, you know? So maybe cause George is just like, ah, I can't get everybody back to the night fort. That's just too much, too much work. Um, what are some other, uh, odds and ends in here? John odds and ends. Um, Liana Mormont, her name actually changed a couple times in the drafts. So, do you know who Liana Liana Mormont's original name was? Was supposed to be Jarella. <laughs> I see it here. Jarella, yeah, Jarella, and then it, she gets changed to Marjorie Mormont. Oh. <laughs> and then and then to uh Liana Mormont, you know? Like um and G stuff mentions that there's one line that actually is pretty good that got cut that he doesn't know why it got cut. So Stannis says Stannis says that insolent whelp in need of hiding, I'd call her. Um, Stannis read from the letter. Bear Island knows no king in the north, uh, whose name is whose name is Stark. He crushed the paper with his fist. The girl presumes to shout at me. <laughs> the girl, which is a pretty funny line. The girl presumes to shout at me, like because she wrote in all capitals. <laughs> I know why he cut it, and that was like I think that. Um, uh, it's a fairly recent phenomenon that all capitals means shouting, like something from 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 being online, like like you know. I don't know if like in that time, all capitals was considered shouting. So that's cut it for that that's reason. a good. That's a good. Okay, I didn't think of that one. Okay, that's pretty. That's that's a good point. Yeah. So you know. But it's 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 a pretty funny line though. The girl presumes to shout it. I would I would assume he cut it because um, he doesn't want Stannis to come across as like you know that like ridiculous to you know of, of a little girl. But yeah, yeah, little girl getting to him as well. You're right. The girl, you know, the girl angering him too much. Um. So also, uh, Dolores Ed, he had a dream where he was pissing off the wall, and then the Horn of Joramond um blue and he was afraid to piss you know um and so that was that was cut for some reason um i guess you know too many too many people having dreams um and then this is a big one um yeah more more about like john being a beastling people calling him a beastling which was seated more in in um um 
a clash of kings and a storm of swords and him being a warg being a big deal something that all of a sudden everybody doesn't really care about um in uh in a dance with dragons too much um and then finally or not finally but with john um Janice slint uh doesn't die <laughs> at least in these early chapters oh um yeah which ah uh, gosh gets me on my janice slint like uh, i've got this like janice slint rant about like how i think janice slint is a horrible plot like i just i i know some people really love like the whole john having a fitting execution of janice slint um but i think that janice slint like every aspect of his story is just poorly done like it 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 bugs yeah it bugs me it so it bugs me that in a clash of kings Tyrion spends all of this time an entire chapter like interviewing janice slint like ta- having dinner with janice slint and then deciding to send him to the wall um supposedly it seems because he was angry that he killed uh that he um uh it, not just the fact that like keep in mind that oh jesus so janice slint <laughs> is really is really a loyal character to the Lannisters who essentially guaranteed them their, their crown. Like they, they, the, the coup fails because Janice, because Cersei convinces or um, uh, Littlefinger convinces Janice Slint to support Cersei. Okay. This is the, this is the whole big thing. So he's a loyal Lannister man and he's given, he's given uh, Harrenhal as a reward for, for such a move. Okay. The Lannisters owe him everything. And so it always bugged me that Tyrion just waltzes into town and is like, you know what? Janice Slint, like, you know, your boy Al Ardim, like, killed a baby and uh, you're, you're Cersei's man. So I'm going to, like, send you to the wall. It always bugged me because it's like, well, what kind of statement are you making that to everyone around you that those that help us get sent to the wall? Like, it's such a it's such a weird move that Tyr- that Tyrion does this. Like I, he does it essentially because he sees, he sees Slint as Cersei's man. Um, you know, there, there's like a small element of like who ordered, uh, um, Ned's execution, but it's like Slint was kind of following orders from Joffrey and Joffrey is probably following influence from Littlefinger. So it always bugged me that like, it's such a bad example to take such a loyal man who owe, you who you owe everything to and send him to the wall. And, and meanwhile, Littlefinger, the real threat, nothing's done with him. Like Littlefinger just, I mean, uh, Tyrion just drops the ball. It's just, it's, I find, I always hated the beginning of A Clash of Kings for this reason. I think we did an entire video about the, the biggest plot hole about how Tyrion just lets Littlefinger get away with everything when he knows Littlefinger like tried to kill him and he was like he like had his whole sky cell adventure in the eerie because of Littlefinger and the dagger like it always bugged me that like that that Tyrion was was focusing on on Janice Slint instead of Littlefinger like it, I, I I hated that but then I was like okay I guess George just really wanted Janice Slint to be beheaded by John. that was always like the excuse I had in my head that, that that it was clumsy. It's this really clumsy plot, but it's all because George was planning the the execution of Janice Slint. And then I find out here that no, George <laughs> George came up with that like super late randomly, and that Janice Slint was going to live and have a bigger plot. It's just so freaking random. I also don't like, even though like fans really love like John cutting off Janice Slint's head. I always thought it was also stupid because like John doesn't know that Janice Slint was involved in, in the, the net execution thing. It's completely random that he executes Janice Slint uh, in that way. And he's not really, and even if it's like, Oh, it's fitting poetry that, that like Janice Slint is beheaded because he, by John, because he ended up killing John's dad by beheading, by beheading him. But it's not really fitting because he was following orders from Joffrey and like it, 
I, I never I never thought the parallel was very good. I thought every <laughs> aspect of Janice Slint is just clumsy. And this is just and of course, like on top of this, all of the other dropped plots that center around it, like Al or the or the or the or the religious fanatics or that just disappear, you know? Like it and then to find out that like Janice Slint, like it, it just didn't it just he he didn't even plan on killing like i don't know he didn't have any plans for janice slint he just he was going to send janice slint to the wall and he didn't know what to do with him and then so i think eventually george is just like screw it i guess i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm just gonna have janice slint beheaded um oh another thing that also like is so stupid about the janice slint plot is that janice slint is is the loyal lannister man at the wall who is willing to do anything for the Lannisters, despite the fact that he's been sent to the wall, which again, none of these things make sense. The Lannisters send him to the wall. They send their most loyal person to the wall as a, as a horrible example. And then he gets to the wall and he's still loyal to the Lannisters to the bone. And, and like, even though they betrayed him, like ugh, every aspect of it's just, Oh, I hate it. Um, but, but like there's an entire plot in a feast for crows where they're talking about sending a person to the wall to assassinate Jon Snow, yet they still think Janice Slint is alive. Like, why would they just, why wouldn't they just have Janice Slint do it? Like, I don't, it's just, oh, just, there's so many aspects of Janice Slint that I just hate. But this gets into all of this, that George had no plan. And I think he just figured, ah, might as well just kill off Janice. Because there's no, I don't I don't know what I'm doing with this character, which is very clear. You he didn't know what he was doing with the character. Oh man, oh man. Oh, it's okay, buddy. Nothing, nothing makes sense with Janice Slint. Nothing, nothing Tyrion does. Nothing, nothing that happens at the wall. Nothing that Janice does. Nothing that everybody. Nothing that Cersei does. Just oh, it's such a such a random freaking thing. <sighs> By the way, there's actually when we get into Cersei, there's actually even more about like the assassination plot of Jon Snow and how um, in the original draft, Arain Waters recommends like bringing a drum, bringing the Drummond, like the 500 person Drummond with like 500 men up to uh, to assassinate Jon Snow. 